following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, rotation is the word they use. Touchdown tornado. It was coming directly for our house. One woman scrambles for cover. She started describing that the pressure changed and that it's here. A survival. I heard my wife screaming. From the center of the storm. The door smashing and the glass breaking. How did she make it out alive? I remember just screaming, Jesus. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. We're seeing bans on large gatherings, campaign rallies canceled. Airlines are now reducing domestic flights in America's first containment zone. The United States is fighting back against the coronavirus. The number of cases here in the U.S. has reached a new threshold. In some of the hardest hit communities, officials are taking drastic measures. Dale Hurd begins our coverage. As the number of cases of coronavirus in the U.S. passes 1,000, government officials, businesses, schools, and even political candidates are taking new steps to contain the virus. Some universities are going to online classes, and airlines are reducing domestic flights. On the campaign trail, Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden both canceled rallies. And New Rochelle, New York, has been declared America's first containment zone. It is a dramatic action. This is literally a matter of uh, life and death. The containment zone is a one-mile radius around the Young Israel Synagogue, where dozens of people were exposed by a sick attorney. Dr. Anthony Fauci at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases warned the rest of the nation to take precautions. It doesn't matter if you're in a state that has no cases or one case. You have to start taking seriously what you can do now. Vice President Pence says over a million more test kits will be distributed to local areas by the end of the week. And President Trump is urging Americans to stay calm. This was unexpected. It will go away. Stocks gained almost 5% on Wall Street Tuesday as the Dow jumped more than 1,100 points, recovering about half of the market's historic losses from the day before. But the market is expected to remain volatile. President Trump is proposing a possible payroll tax cut to stimulate the economy. And it's likely the Treasury Department will extend the April 15 tax deadline to help individuals and businesses. We're also going to be talking about hourly wage earners getting uh, help so that they can uh, be in a position where they're not going to ever miss a paycheck. Economic advisor Larry Kudlow says the cut could last through the end of the year. The payroll tax holiday is a bold move. It's a very bold move. But Democratic leaders came out against it. The administration seems to believe that the answer to any problem is another tax cut. Most states aren't seeing the high number of cases like New York or California, but they're preparing for the worst. CBN's Eric Phillips shows us how Virginia health officials are getting ready. Here in Central Virginia, government leaders are taking a regional approach where the coronavirus is concerned. Dr. Danny Avila serves as public health director for the city of Richmond and neighboring Henrico County. He says COVID-19's elusive nature makes it difficult to spot and stop. One of the challenges is that when 80 plus percent of individuals who get the virus have really kind of indistinguishable cold symptoms, uh, we, they can transmit the virus to, to people who are much more susceptible to it without really knowing it. That alone, he adds, significantly increases chances the disease spreads to this community. I'm very concerned. Why? Because people don't know how to cover their mouth. And I'm scared for more older people and younger people, but not necessarily for myself. Hoping to address growing concerns, health and emergency management leaders here have activated an incident management team for the region. And so now, instead of each locality having to make their own uh, kind of best best guesses or, or decisions based on the information they have, uh, that will all be streamlined through a, a regional infrastructure. The decisions that we make collectively about 
uh, whether to hold a, a basketball game or, uh, you know, that affects not just the people in one locality, but those, those have regional implications. That also includes decisions like closing schools, businesses, or even advising churches to cancel service. I mean, if we're having widespread transmission and we're starting to see deaths here in Virginia, and again, I fully expect all of those things to happen, then I think there will be clear guidance to, to faith communities and congregations to say, you know, maybe we do a web service this week or for this period of time. We, we probably do need to make changes in uh, the way that we're delivering communion. So I think the church has an opportunity here really to show that it, it will practice its faith over fear. Richmond Community Church senior pastor Rick McDaniel says he doesn't foresee canceling any services. I think we would always have church. We always have the doors of the church open. We'd always have services and then people would have to make up their own decisions about whether they want to come or not. Now states have the ability to test locally for COVID-19 rather than having to send samples to the CDC in Atlanta. Still, Avila says the availability of test kits is limited and the required criteria for testing means cases will slip through the cracks. Health officials stress people should not panic, but they should remain vigilant, realizing that curbing everyday social norms like shaking hands may be the safest idea. In Richmond, Virginia, Eric Phillips, CBN News. CBN medical reporter Lori Johnson joins us now for more on the response to the coronavirus. Lori, let me ask you this question. Uh, you know, we've we've seen a steady increase. At what point in time can, can we start seeing this really get to epidemic proportions? Right now we're dealing with a thousand cases. Uh, what, what's the prognosis here? Uh, are we looking at 10,000 in a week, 100,000 in a week? What, what's the multiplication here? Gordon, yesterday the White House Coronavirus Task Force held a news conference and addressed that very thing. They talked about their strategy for dulling or hampering uh, a severe increase and a peak number of cases. They looked at places like China and South Korea and noticed that what's going on with this corona coronavirus is it's there's a steady increase, then there's a peak, and a lot of times that's when these governments are putting in these aggressive containment policies, and then they see the number of cases drastically decrease, and we're seeing that. And so what the American strategy is, is to co go ahead and enact these strict containment policies now before it gets to that critical stage that you were talking about. In other words, to nip it in the bud, to head it off at the pass. Okay, so what are we going to see in terms of containment? What, what kind of rules are, are we going to have to deal with? Well, right now, the Coronavirus Task Force is encouraging Americans to enact some lifestyle changes that are different. Dr. Anthony Fauci, who is the infectious disease specialist on the task force, said our life is very different now and is going to be very different now than it was a few months ago, but then reminded everyone that this is just temporary. So specifically, what are we talking about? Well, the things that we've been talking about for the last few weeks, as far as keeping your hands clean, staying home if you're sick, coughing in or sneezing into your arm and so forth. But then also they've ramped it up a little bit, saying that everyone over the age of 60 should go ahead and right now get supplies that will last them for two weeks in case they need to self-quarantine. We're talking about food and medical supplies right now because if you get tested positive, you're going to be asked to self-quarantine if you don't have very severe symptoms that would require hospitalization. So if you're tested positive for the coronavirus, the last thing you want to do is go out to the Walmart and start stocking up for two weeks and infecting everybody in the store. So they're asking people to do that kind of thing right now. Also, people over the age of 60 right now are being encouraged to avoid crowded areas. So places that where they might have maybe 250 people or more definitely to avoid those types of scenarios. And then there are those of us who are not at high risk are also asked to take extreme precautions so that we don't infect people who are older who might be more susceptible to serious complications from this virus. All right, Laurie, thanks for the insights. If you want to learn more about how you can protect your health, we have some fact sheets available for you. Uh, the one I recommend is protect your gut. If you have a, a really good gut, um, um, the, all the wonderful bacteria that 
they really help you against any kind of immune response to this kind of an infection. So we've got it for you. It's absolutely free. It's called Protect Your Gut. Call us 1-800-700-7000. And if you're over 60 like me, please look at these guidelines and say, okay, I need two weeks worth of medicine. I need two weeks worth of supplies. If I get into contact with this and I'm forced to go into a self quarantine, I'm going to be able to do that and spend two weeks as an introvert and just stay at home. Uh, and that way you're, you're not going to infect anyone else. And Lord willing, you're not gonna get the infection yourself. Well, in other news, Joe Biden is on a clear path to the Democratic nomination for president after scoring big wins in Tuesday's primaries. John Jessup has more on that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? Thanks, Gordon. Joe Biden's decisive victory in the key battleground state of Michigan widens his delegate lead over rival Bernie Sanders. The former vice president also won primaries in Missouri, Mississippi and Idaho, dealing a serious blow to one of the last remaining primary opponents for the Democratic nomination. Biden leads Sanders in the delegate race 836 to Sanders 672. Well, the United States House is seeking to reform a surveillance law that was misused for political purposes in the Russia probe. Congress created the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, or FISA, to guard against abuse by spy agencies. But a Justice Department investigation found that an application for a warrant to spy on a 2016 Trump campaign aide contained misinformation. Lawmakers want several revisions before re re renewing the law, including stronger congressional oversight in the FISA process and punishing those who abuse the FISA court. And Gordon, whatever deal is struck still has to pass in the Senate. Well, what's going to happen in a divided Senate, Senate is up in the air, but here's some bottom line. Uh, the FBI agents that put that false information in front of the FISA court are now barred for life for ever asking for another warrant, FISA warrant again. Uh, so there is some teeth here, but uh, this is in incredible. And you look at the, the abuse that happened in 2016 and how did we ever get to this surveillance state where somehow people in the FBI think it's perfectly okay uh, to in, uh, start surveillance of a presidential campaign. Uh, it's mind boggling that they would do that and then even further mind boggling that they would lie. Uh, that's, that's what's been proven, that they gave false information to the FISA court in order to get that warrant. Uh, what are the consequences? And in my personal opinion, it needs to be far more than you're banned from applying for further warrants. Uh, there needs to be some really strong action. We cannot have a surveillance state, particularly for our political campaigns. This is, this is not the America we want to have. Wendy? Thanks, Gordon. Still ahead, fans know him from Lord of the Rings and Indiana Jones. Actor John Rhys Davies talks about his upcoming movie, I Am Patrick. Hear how he developed the character of the patron saint of Ireland later on today's show. And up next, an amazing shift. Regions that were once mission fields have become the mission force. The new wave of missionaries from Asia, Africa, and South America coming up. It's a seismic shift in the global church in the last century. Christianity has exploded in Asia, Africa, and South America. Not only are churches flourishing in these parts of the world, they're also sending missionaries to the four corners of the earth. George Thomas has the story. Last month in Brazil, 140,000 people met in three stadiums pledging to make the Great Commission their main ambition. Three million more watched online, promising to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to every nation. And we declare today, now is the time for harvest. Half 
half a world away, Chinese Christians under intense persecution hold 24-hour-a-day secret prayer meetings crying out for the nations. A similar scene plays out 7,000 miles away in North Africa. God has put, put in our heart to be able to send 1,000 missionaries by the year 2025. And I really believe maybe one day America will end up with some Muslims, converts, missionaries coming to reach out to the Muslims there. It's a far cry from those early days when Western missionary legends like William Carey, Hudson Taylor and David Livingston labored decades before seeing the fruits of their labor. Today, missionaries answer that same call. This new generation, however, comes from, among other places, the remote parts of Mongolia, desert sands of the Middle East and Southeast Asia. And so before we, you would think of a missionary in the, in the 1900s as pale, white, British folks dressed in somewhat Victorian clothes. That is over now. We have missionaries now that look like everyone. Their efforts and those of countless others helping fuel the explosive growth of Christianity. It is true that there is a shift taking place at the moment. And there are less missionaries coming from the United States and Europe. But it doesn't mean for a moment that there are less missionaries. While the U.S. sends out the highest number of missionaries, more than half of those serving worldwide now come from Asia, Africa and South America, regions that were once mission fields becoming the mission force. So from countries that used to be kind of the, the focus point of mission, they have become the major players. In, in mission. In this part of Ukraine. Among them, the likes of Ukrainian Sergei Rakuba, who is training hundreds of young people to be the next Christian generation spreading the gospel. The future of the countries of the former Soviet Union is not in the hands of political leaders in the Kremlin or in the presidential palaces of Ukraine, Moldova or Belarus, but it is in the hands of young Christians who with the renewed heart, renewed vision and desire are taking the gospel into contemporary society and influence it for eternity. For several years, Rakuba's group, Mission Eurasia, has been sending dozens of Russian missionary teams to Mongolia, holding camps for thousands of children, many of whom have never heard the name of Christ. We are in a remote western part of Mongolia, and it is still one of the most unreached places in the world. Sometimes we think that people around the world know about Jesus, but there are places like this that haven't been touched by the gospel. To better appreciate the significance of these camps, you have to understand the history of Christianity here in Mongolia. Shortly after the fall of communism, there were only 10 believers in the entire country. Today, some 26 years later, some 60,000 believers are spread across this vast nation. 17-year-old Elena said she got the call to missions at a young age. This is her third visit to Mongolia. When I was nine years old, I read a book about a missionary in a foreign country. And since then, I have had this burning desire to share God's love with people. One place burning with missionary zeal is Africa. The prestigious Pew Research Center found that people who live south of the Sahara Desert and stretching all the way to the tip of Africa are seeking God unlike any other part of the world. Pew predicts that by 2060, Africa will be the most Christian continent. Congregations like Grace Bible Church in Johannesburg, South Africa, taking advantage of the phenomenal growth, sending missionaries across the continent. We come from a history where things were done for us. People came to us to tell us about Christ. We were the so-called dark continent, you know, and all of that. But we realize history changes. Scores of missionaries now bringing the gospel back to re-evangelize a secular and often irreligious West. You're just getting a, a much more diverse um, missionary movement now, where people are basically going from everywhere to everywhere. And you're even getting missionaries from Africa and Latin America who are going to Europe, who are going to North America. So the courage of the African and the Asians of coming into the West should, number one, put us to shame and then should motivate us that we, the ones who have taken the gospel to the East, now should be not all welcoming, but embracing them.
Dr. Becker says the modern missions movement is thriving as countless from around the world take up the mantle of obeying Jesus' command to make disciples of all nations. And in some ways, we are back really at that early vision that we find in the book of Acts, where the Holy Spirit is poured forth on men and women from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, and they are sent forth to the ends of the earth to proclaim the gospel of Christ. George Thomas, CBN News. And that's one of the central messages of the gospel is we need to take the gospel. How can you love your neighbor if you withhold the gospel from them? And so it's this rise of cross-cultural missionaries that, that will transcend culture, will transcend national borders. Uh, we want to get the gospel out around the world. And we're following examples. And the example of the Apostle Paul, where he would go, he would speak in the local language. He would try to become all things to all men that he might by any means win some. And then there's another example in that St. Patrick who was taken as a child from Britain to Ireland. He learned the Irish language because he was made a slave. God miraculously delivered him from slavery. He became a bishop in the church only to have God call him back to the very people that enslaved him. His missionary methods are still re relevant today. He would preach not in Latin, he would preach in the local Gaelic Irish language. He would take up people from his converts and say, you're now the minister here. You're now the pastor of this church. You're now the shepherd of this church. He would ordain them and put them into to ministry. It's a wonderful story. We have a docudrama called I Am Patrick. It's going to be out this St. Patrick's Day, March 17th, March 18th only. Special Fathom event. If you'd like to go to it, uh, go to IamPatrick.com. If you click on the link of find tickets, uh, you'll find a, a theater near you. All you have to do is type in your zip code. We're in over a thousand theaters across America. Uh, so there'll be a place where you can go and you can see this wonderful movie. And I hope it inspires you to, to, to realize two things. One, God still speaks today. Number two, God still sends today. So if you'd like to get those messages, get them to as many people as possible, uh, go to IamPatrick.com. Wendy? Now we want to take you behind the scenes of I Am Patrick. Let's take a look at actor John Reese davies in his role as Old Patrick. To narrate in detail, either the whole story of my labors or even parts of it would take a long time. When looking for the voice of old Patrick, my first person that I wanted was John Reese davies What's that? What are you doing? How many are you doing? Thousands. They're all going on Facebook, John. He's Welsh. He's got a great voice. It was kind of a dream come true for me. And then when I met up with him and then we did the voiceover, he just nailed it. He so captured the essence of St. Patrick. And I was like, we have to have him play old Patrick. Actually, I'm, I'm sorry to say that we're actually ready for Oh my God. <laughs> I am Patrick because I got lucky enough to be employed on this marvelous project. I was drawn to this project because I love the character of Patrick. I think he's a fascinating modern. And he's a great man. He's the beginnings of Irish literature. Today is our big day. We're here filming one of the final scenes in the movie. It's just a spectacular sunset, and he's just been an absolute pleasure to deal with all day and a true professional. Rolling, guys. Camera set. Set. And action. My latest movie is called I Am Patrick, and you're looking at the older Patrick now. It'll be in movie theaters across America for two days on the 17th and 18th of March. I hope to see you there. What a character. Well, don't miss this compelling docudrama on the life of St. Patrick. Be sure to get your tickets for I Am Patrick Now. The two-night Fathom event will be in theaters March 17th and 18th, as Gordon mentioned. Just go to IamPatrick.com to see showtimes and reserve your seats. Coming up, in the Lone Star State, a Texas-sized twister, explosive sounds all around this woman just before the killer storm suddenly sucked her right out of her home. How did she survive? 
You have to see it to believe it after this. Tornadoes, nature's most brutal storms. Last year, a monster tornado slammed down in Texas, demolishing everything in its path. This terrifying twister shredded the house of a woman named Jen Como when she was all alone inside her home. I knew there were a possibility of severe storms that were coming, but no idea what the effect of, of those were gonna be. You know, you go your whole life going through bad storms, especially living in a place like Texas. The forecast for Dan and Jen Como's area called for severe weather, as it had the prior weekend. Jen planned to be at home while her husband went to weekend reserve duty five hours away. The kids went with him to visit nearby family. I wasn't too worried about it. I was just, okay, well, you know, it'll rain hard, it'll wind will blow, okay. Jen wasn't concerned either, until after Dan left. Then she felt a stirring in her spirit. I heard the Lord just impart to me, I need you to pray over these storms. And so I did. I listened to that and I prayed over that and sang his praises and anointed the house. The forecast, showers and thunderstorms today with strong... The next morning, Jen kept an eye on the weather reports. I saw as the radar started tracking another storm coming through, I started to get a little concerned that it was getting so close. So she called Dan. I was at reserve drill on Saturday, and she said, you might want to look at the weather report. I'm a little concerned. And so I pulled it up on my phone, and the radar was not looking good. Rotation is the word they used. In fact, a funnel cloud had been spotted near the Como's town. The last thing I wanted her was in a vehicle and a storm bearing down on top of her, so I felt like the safest place was in our home. OK. Dogs cared for, check. Flashlight, check. Cell phone, check. Jen prepared while she took several more calls from concerned friends. Then came the warning. A tornado had hit downtown Alto, just one mile from their home. It was coming directly for our house, so yeah, I started getting nervous. And so was Dan. He called Jen again, who by now had crated the dogs and taken cover in their bedroom closet. A sudden stillness came over the house. You could feel that the tornado was there. You could sense that it was there without seeing out of the door. And then I just started praying. She started describing that the pressure changed and that it's here. The Holy Spirit just put Psalm 91 in my mind. I pulled it up on my phone right there while I was talking to her, and I just started reading it with authority. He shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night. Then that's when I heard the door smashing and the glass breaking all around me. And it wasn't just breaking, it was exploding. And my ears were popping, and the pressure changed in the entire environment. Louder than anything was the sound of all the timber cracking around the house. It sounded like a thousand toothpicks being snapped. I could hear my house being shredded over the phone, you know, and I heard my wife screaming and I heard the dogs barking. Never have I felt so helpless in my entire life. I was terrified. <laughs> I remember just screaming, Jesus. I can remember almost as the words came out, I was being tumbled out of the house. It was that quickly. Then all Dan could hear was complete silence. And I was just shouting, trying to get her to respond. Honey, are you OK? Answer me. Finally, in a very faint distance, I heard, I think it was my wife, shouting, help. So at that point, the hardest decision I had to make was to hang up so I could start calling people to come help us. Dan got a hold of friends from church who rushed right over to try to find Jen. This experience put me in a position of just complete and utter vulnerability and dependency on everybody else in God's kingdom to actually come in and to do things that I was just completely incapable of doing at that moment. Boy, did they show up. The Como home was demolished, 
but Jen was only bruised. And the dogs were fine too. She walked out to the road, flagged down a driver, and got to the hospital to be checked over. On the way, she used a phone to call Dan. Within 20 minutes, she walked away with this, with a little bump on the head and a little bit of road rash. The friends from church brought her home and started salvaging what they could from the wreckage. Them taking care of her and being there allowed me the ability to, you know, get there and, and not panic for five hours straight. We just walked up to each other, embraced, and it was just, we were whole again, you know? Now all settled in another home, the Como say God's word and prayer have new meaning for them. And I have never been more scared in my life, but also more sure in my life that I was gonna be protected. The power of prayer is our prayers are real and what we say matters. He's always listening, he's always there, and he always answers. Everything in the Bible is absolutely real. He deserves every bit of praise and every bit of glory and every bit of honor for everything he's done for me before, during, and after this storm. Just a miracle that she survived and everybody is happy and healthy today. Gordon, nothing terrifies me like a tornado. That is just you so... You were watching the piece and you were <laughs> hugging yourself. I was like, ah! <laughs> As the tornado approached, and and you, you you look at these things, and yes, there are troubles in this world. Uh, there are plagues. The, we're looking at coronavirus. We're looking at multiple storms. Uh, just start thinking of the number of hurricanes that hit, the horrible tornadoes that hit Nashville. Uh, these things, the, 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 it just seems to be an increasing pace. But the good news that we have is that God is with us. And just as he protected that family, he will protect you. Now we're going to pray. We're gonna pray for miracles for you. We're also gonna pray for God's protection for you. And just the same prayer that that wonderful husband was praying over his wife as he's literally hearing his house be torn down around her. He is praying for Psalm 91 over her. He's praying that she would be protected under the wings of the Most High God, that she would find shelter. And his prayer was answered. Realize that God can be your all-sufficient one. He can be your healer. He can be your restorer. He can be your protector. He can be your shield. He can be your all in all. You don't need to be afraid of the arrow that flies by, by day or the pestilence that comes by night because you have the assurance that he will be with you. And here's his promise that he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He is right there. He is just a prayer away. The sermon of Jesus in the first chapter of, of Mark is one of my favorite ones. Realize the time is fulfilled. That means it's right now. The kingdom of God is at hand. That means you can reach up and get it. It's right within your grasp. The kingdom of God is right there. All we have to do is change our thinking and believe the good news. Believe that he's there. Believe that he wants to provide. Believe that he wants to heal. Now, before we pray, we want to encourage you. We've got some other miracle reports that have come in. Here's Linda from... Uh, I can't pronounce this, Otaha, Oklahoma. She had serious chest pains on and off for three years. As a nurse, she took her own advice, tried not to panic, took aspirin, but when the pains became consistent for two or three nights in a row, she became very concerned. Well, during this time, she watched the 700 Club. And here, Wendy gave a word of knowledge. She said her name, Linda, and declared healing for her heart. Linda believed by faith, hasn't had any chest pains since. I love that. All right, here's Carlos of Port Lavaca, Texas, was diagnosed with gallstones and developed a serious infection. He was in the hospital for 24 days and was finally discharged wearing a tube and drainage bag. Well, one day he was watching the club and he heard you give a word of knowledge, Gordon, declaring someone healed from gallstones and an infection. Carlos claimed that healing when he next saw his doctor 
She was puzzled since there was absolutely no infection. <laughs> she removed the tube and bag and told Carlos, Carlos to keep his gallbladder. <laughs> Way to go. Hey, praise God for what he does, for what he does. He'll do it for you. He's no respecter of persons. You don't have to clean up first. You don't have to do anything first. All you have to do is believe. Believe. Change your thinking. Believe the good news. And let God do all the rest. Let's pray. Lord, we lift those in the audience right now who are suffering. We lift those who have needs for healing, needs for pain. Lord, we, we lift everyone who is afraid of this horrible virus. And we just ask for your shield of protection to be around them. And we take the authority that you have given us as believers in yes. you. We take authority over this virus. And we say you have no ability anymore to reproduce. Mm -hmm. You have no more ability to spread and to contaminate our schools, our hospitals, our nursing homes, our places of work. Be gone now in Jesus' name and come back and, and reproduce no more, mutate no more in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. And now we lift those who are praying for healing in their bodies. Mm -hmm. And we ask that you would stretch forth your hand to do miracles today, that you would appear, that your presence would be manifest, that you would impart faith to, to people to believe for the impossible, what doctors say is impossible is always possible with you. So we command healing now in Jesus' name, and we receive it by faith. We receive it now. There's someone you've got a um, terrible problem and terrible pain in your right kidney. Uh, it's like the entire lower portion of the kidney is inflamed. And we just speak healing throughout that kidney right now. All that infection, any blockage right now in Jesus' name, be gone. Any, any precancerous mass or any cancer now, be gone in Jesus' name and be completely healed of it. You just felt something go through your kidney and you're healed in Jesus' name. Go back and get tested and realize that God has done a wonderful work for you. Wendy, what did it got you? Um, I'm just seeing a lot of elderly people very, very fearful. And the Lord is saying to you today, do not be afraid. Remember who you are. Remember my word. Stand on Psalm 91. No plague, no pestilence shall come near you. God is with you. He will take care of you. Just claim that over yourself and your household in Jesus' name. And we bind the spirit of fear that is trying to harass so many right now in our country. We bind you, Satan. You cannot and will not do this to, to the children of God because we have the shield of faith. And Lord, we thank you right now for that peace that surpasses all understanding and your healing touch right now for those who need it in Jesus' name. Uh, there's someone you've got a severe sinus infection and it's uh, recurring drainage uh, down your palate into your throat. And God has just healed all of that. He's taken on the infection away and that uh, that drip he's taken away. You've, you've, you know, it's almost like you're living with it. And, and God is saying, no, you don't have to live with this anymore. I'm healing you right now in the name of Jesus. Someone else with a severe infection in your left eye. God is taking all that infection away. Uh, he's removing all the redness. It's going to be clear. Uh, your eyes going to be completely healed and made whole now in Jesus name. In Jesus name. Lord, we thank you. We thank you. You are our protector. You are our healer. When we receive you, we receive every answer to every human need. We thank you for it in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. If you have been touched, let us know. Share your good report. And if you need prayer, we're here for you. Uh, we want to break that spirit of fear over your life. Uh, and if you need prayer, we're here for you. All you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000, and just say, I need prayer. We believe in prevailing prayer. It's our honor, our privilege to pray for you. And if you want more information about this coronavirus, we have a special news alert coronavirus, what you need to, to know. But the really important thing is on the backside of that, 
It's Psalm 91, and I encourage people now to read Psalm 91. It's safety of abiding in the presence of God. When you have God present with you, no disease can come near your house, near your body. Pray Psalm 91 over yourself, just as that wonderful husband in that story, Dan, he was praying Psalm 91 over his wife. As the hurricane is destroying their home, she is protected. God answers that prayer. So memorize it. Memorize Psalm 91. We've got it in this fact sheet. All you got to do is call us. We'll be glad to email it to you or we can send it to you uh, via snail mail. Either way, 1-800-700-7000, absolutely free. Wendy? Thanks. All right. Well, coming up, a Holocaust survivor who endured the horrors of the Nazi invasion of Ukraine. See how this poor widow, now living in Israel, received a helping hand. Also ahead, a big fishing competition, and you'll never believe who got in the boat with this fisherman. See how the champion made the biggest comeback in Bass Master Classic history later on today's show. And welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. An Israeli court rejected Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's request to delay the start of his corruption trial. Netanyahu is charged with fraud, breach of trust, and accepting bribes in connection with a series of scandals. He denies any wrongdoing. Netanyahu's lawyers, though, had sought a delay for more time to review evidence, but a district court in Jerusalem ruled it will begin as planned next week. Well, Pastor Greg Laurie says fear of the coronavirus may be worse than the virus itself. The Harvest Christian Fellowship pastor in Southern California offered prayerful advice in a recent sermon. Let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God that passes all human understanding will keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Listen, God is bigger than the coronavirus. Don't be afraid. Lori also said that the promises of God are true and that He offers peace to those who earnestly seek Him. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Gordon and Wendy will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Manya remembers being herded into a Nazi ghetto. During the war, she survived on a diet of beetroots. Other members of her family didn't make it out alive. And today, she is a widow living in Israel. And she's found hope thanks to CBN Partners. As I sat with Manya in her small apartment in Nazareth, she told me about her life under Nazi occupation during the Holocaust. One of my earliest memories is of my father and eldest brother leaving to join the Red Army and the sadness I felt seeing them go. Then the Nazi came and turned our village into a ghetto. It all happened so fast. Thousands of Jews from the surrounding area were forced into the ghetto. Manya's family shared their tiny house with 22 people and worked in the fields from morning to night. Every day I cried to my mother because I was so hungry. Sometimes she gave me a piece of the beetroots. The Nazi made us grow in the fields. This is how we survived. But many people in my family were beaten or killed before liberation. Manya immigrated to Israel with her husband in 1990. Now she's a widow living alone in poverty. So CBN Israel brings her food regularly. Lately, it's been harder for Manya to get around. To help, we got her a new walker with a built-in chair she can use to rest whenever she needs to. The food is wonderful and the walker is so nice. I be able to get out more and that makes me happy. I can't say enough how grateful I am. With the support of CBN Israel donors, Manya says her hope has been restored. This help is so important. It's good for my soul. It encourages me to know you care about what we went through. In Hebrew, we say, Todarni Kerev Lev. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. And if you're a member of the 700 Club, that thank you goes to you. A portion of every gift goes into the work of Operation Blessing. Another portion goes into the work of CBN International. 
you're a part of all of it, everything we do when you join the 700 Club. For a gift of $20 or more a month, we'll send you the, my father's latest book. It's called The Ten Laws for Success. Along with that, you'll get a preview of his upcoming book, I Have Walked with the Living God. Uh, all uh, is our gift to you when you join the 700 Club. And if you want to designate your gift to CBN Israel so that all of it goes into our work in CBN Israel, whether that's for the News Bureau there, for these wonderful documentaries we're doing about Israel, or for the humanitarian work that CBN Israel is doing inside Israel, you can designate your gift by writing to us, or you can call or go to CBN.com. There's a place on the giving page where you can designate. When? When? All right. Well, Randy Howe was in 11th place. The media had written off any chance that he might win the 2014 Bassmaster Classic Fishing Tournament. Then, suddenly, a passenger appeared in his boat riding shotgun. And Randy was about to make history. I used to think it was pretty cool all the time that, that Jesus was always with fishermen and, uh, and ever golfers and the Bible was always fishermen. That's kind of my joke about that. And, and uh, so uh, it did draw me to want to read more and learn more, just interested in why Jesus chose fishermen. Randy Howe has always loved fishing. The fishing lifestyle is a lifestyle of faith because you're chasing after, you know, a little green fish that, you're, that you don't see. You know, and it's a lot like your journey with Christ. It's all faith-based. You can't see it, you know, so that's a pretty good parallel. Randy came to faith as a young boy while attending vacation Bible school. About 12 years old is when I really felt the, the Holy Spirit tugging at my heart and that conviction to where I knew, you know, what right and wrong really was and that I wanted to, you know, be saved and have a relationship with, with Jesus. He says that from a young age, he knew he had a call that might involve fishing. My mom took me to a lot of revivals and a lot of places like that. Pastors would, would call me out in a crowd there and say, you know, God's got, uh, a, you know, a special calling on your life. But as a teen, Randy began experiencing health issues that threatened to derail his dreams of a fishing career. I found out I had ulcerative colitis, but little did I know it was going to turn into something big and major, you know, where surgeries were going to be required, and that, that was the big shocker. After high school, Randy married Robin and got his first pro fishing tour card when his illness struck with a vengeance. I was on the lake fishing, and the first day I was in 10th place, and I needed to make the top 10 to advance to the All-American. And I started throwing up blood. I came in from fishing. Uh, I was by myself. I lived eight hours from where I was at the tournament, so I worked my way back, stopping at gas stations, throwing up blood. Randy got to a hospital in Rocky Mount, North Carolina, just in time. Doctors said, you know, you were within a couple hours of, of having peritonitis, and I, I could have died within hours if I hadn't have got there, and that was what made it really real when they, when they told me that. So I had a lot of infections, so they only took two-thirds of my colon out in my first surgery. Because of his health problems, Randy began to wonder if he would ever fish professionally. At Duke, the doctors, you know, said, this is going to be a very difficult thing to chase for you because you're going to end up having a lot of issues with going to the bathroom, possibly more surgeries in the future. And it was a very, it was kind of discouraging report. The illness caused Randy to pursue the Lord deeper. When adversity hits you for the first time, that's when you truly, you know, you go from really religion to relationship. And I totally submitted my life to him at the time, and I said, Lord, whatever you want me to do with my life, whether it's fishing or something else, here I am, I'm, going, I'm, I'm ready to do it. I'm just thankful to be alive. That's where God's miracle work and power came in and healed me quickly because those surgeries should have taken six to nine months between each one, but instead I had all three surgeries within four months, and that was the part that was miraculous. Now that he was healed, Randy went back to fishing. Not only was he winning tournaments and getting endorsements, he now had a platform to share his faith. That's when God said, you know, I didn't call you to be a missionary in China. I called you to be a fisherman, and this is what I want you to go do. So that's where my speaking kind of started. Jesus told stories, and that's what the parables were in the Bible, and that's all I had to do was tell my story, and that's all anybody has to do is tell their story to bring people to know Jesus, and that was, that's what fired me up and got me excited. God was preparing him for the biggest moment in his professional life. In 2014, he was fishing in the Bassmaster Classic at Guntersville Lake, Alabama. I was in 
11th place after two days, and uh, all the media had pretty much, you know, written it off that I could, that anybody outside the top 10 could have a chance of winning. And that's the day that I went out the next morning. And I'm running up the lake, and and it had a clear, just the clearest ever of, of just a Holy Spirit visitation in my boat. And I saw a vision in my mind and and said, turn the boat around now and go to this bridge. And I saw a quick glimpse like a video in my head of me under this bridge casting and catching fish. Randy heeded the voice. I turned the boat around and ran back to this bridge and as soon as I pulled up I started catching fish on every cast and and made the at the time the, the greatest comeback in Bassmaster Classic history. I was almost 10 pounds behind. I came back with the largest catch of the day, 29 pounds, two ounces, and ended up winning by one pound, winning $300,000 the World Championship. I didn't do it, it was God that did it that day. Randy is now one of the top rated bass fishermen in the world. He has had no health issues and continues to win major tournaments. And he continues to tell his story. You gotta fall in love with Jesus. You can't just get a Bible and just say, you know, and go to church and say, I'm a Christian. And when you do that and you go all in, you see it happen and then, then you know it's real. But adversity is gonna make you stronger and, and it's just gonna make you persevere. When you know who's in control and you discover your purpose, then you can make a difference. You just gotta go all in and believe and God will open the doors and take care of you. God will open doors and there's a lot more to that fish story than just a fish story. Uh, and Wendy, I'll give you one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Right. Can you guess? Jesus was a fisher of men? No. Is that a verse? <laughs> I no, it's from John chapter 21, verse 3. I am going fishing. That's from, <laughs> from the apostle Peter. I am going fishing. And then John chimes in, we're going with you. And so take that home to Bill and say, here's yes. a new favorite verse for you. Oh, that's it. It led to the miracle of 153 fish. So go read the chap 21st chapter of John and you'll see a miracle just like what you just saw in that story. We leave you these words from Jesus and Matthew. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.